Hello everybody, this is Alex Fregnani and I welcome you to another episode of the Foresight Chats series. Just a quick announcement, as you might have noticed, I have stopped counting different seasons in the series, just because it made more sense. In fact, there hasn't been a significant difference in the guests between seasons, so I'll just be counting the episodes by number from now on. Also, the cover thumbnails of the episodes on YouTube have been redesigned to give some more visibility to the increasingly high-profile guests I'm having. So I hope you like these changes. Now, coming to today's episode, I am absolutely thrilled to be talking with one of the most well-known management thinkers of all times, Henry Mintzberg. Henry doesn't really need a presentation, but for those of you who don't know him, he is a management writer and educator, he is currently a professor at McGill University in Montreal. He authored 20 books on management, he received 21 honorary doctorate degrees, and basically his ideas about management and strategy are some of the most influential out there and I'm probably understating this. I had a really awesome conversation with Henry on a wide range of super interesting topics, including his latest book, the problems of management education, foresight and scenario planning, of course, strategy, and even canoeing on the lake. So I really hope you will enjoy the conversation. Henry, such an honor to be talking to you. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Alex. Happy to be here. So let's start from your most recent book. You published a book just a few months ago. It's called Understanding Organizations Finally, and it is published with Barrett and Kohler. I uh, confess I have consumed the book in audio version on Audible, and it was really pleasant. This is a rewrite, actually. It's a rewrite of one of your most successful books called Structure in Five, which was published almost 40 years ago, and it was about different forms of organizations. So perhaps we can start from from this book. What has changed since the last edition of the book in terms of things revised and percentage of the book rewritten? Well, to some extent, I've elaborated some of the consequences. So I identified similar forms of organizations in the earlier book and it was very successful but it needed an update it needed and it needed to be rewritten maybe less for the academic side and more for the practitioner side or for the what do you call it pracademics <laughs> it needed to be written more for pracademics in a way it was used in a lot of businesses even when jack welsh reorganized general electric early on uh, his assistant called me because they were using it and they had some questions from it. So it was used in practice a lot, but as used a lot in courses. But of course, that was many years ago. And when I got an email from somebody who says, I love your book, I use it with my high school class, like 15 year olds, when are you revising it? <laughs> I thought maybe it's time to revise. So I sharpened it up, I shortened it, and I elaborated more on how you take these forms that I call personal, program, professional, and project, and see how they mix and match and transition from one to the other and form hybrids, and and what managers do in each of them differently, and how strategy is created differently in each one, and so on. Awesome, awesome. And, you know, I don't want to give up so much of the book content. I don't, I don't want to spill too much tea, but just to say... It is just very interesting from somebody who is teaching in a business school to appreciate how much of this book has seeped into basic fundamental understanding of management. And it's just so influential. So I really appreciated that, that 
Yeah, I think, by the way, I would qualify that statement. I think that's true in much of the world. I don't think it's true in the United States so much. For some reason, my stuff just doesn't succeed nearly as much in the U.S. You know, my places like Quebec, or Canada in general better, but Quebec in particular, especially in French, France, Japan, China, very successful in those places, Morocco. Even more than you would say the Western world, so to speak. More than the Anglo-Saxon countries, more than two, uh, more than the liberal democracies of Britain and America, especially America. Okay. Especially the United States. I'm curious, why is that the case? Do you have an idea? I think there's a kind of uh, rational view of things and the order of things and, you mm -hmm. know... How can anybody claim that you don't formulate strategies at the top to implement them at the bottom? People just walked into those things. And and I think in the, you know, there are plenty of people who like my work and are very enthusiastic. But proportionately, it doesn't have nearly the... Look, I'll give you a very interesting example. Mm. At the Academy of Management, which is the main conference for academics worldwide, and the recent one held in August in Boston... And there were probably eight or 10,000 people there. Uh, I did a book signing with Barrett Kohler. Uh, it was scheduled for an hour and a quarter. It never, the line never gave up. I signed steady for an hour and a quarter, uh, maybe a hundred different books. I counted one American. Wow, that's fascinating. It was loaded with Koreans, Japanese, Moroccans, you name it. One American. I mean, there, there were plenty of other people Maybe you teach in America, but Native Americans. I don't know. I don't know why. Well, still about the book. So in the book, you joke that you are a consummate lumper, right? Somebody who lumps things into categories, explains things. And I appreciate this a lot. You know, it's it's a sort of a it's sort of an organizational archetypes work. And I do appreciate this. And when I do this sort of work. A common response I have from practitioners or pracademic, which annoys me sometimes, is, you know, this work is not really necessary or useful. What matters is practicing managers. So I, I usually get annoyed about that comment. I don't know if you ever had what this sort of comment, but I want to ask you, what do you think is the value of this work for the practitioners who do not see it? Yeah, well, let me go back a bit. It was Darwin who distinguished splitters from lumpers. And, 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 and those two categories are lumps, by the way, right? Splitters and lumpers are lumps. Words are lumps. When I use the word category, it's a lump. It's a, you know, the word category. I have a friend who gets angry when I say things are very unique because he's being a lumper and he says if they're unique or they're not unique. Things can't be very unique or somewhat unique. They're unique or they're not unique. That's lumping. Splitting mm -hmm. is somewhat unique, very, you know, very unique, less unique, and so on. So it's a mentality. And uh, lumps basically look like categories. And I love categories. I'm a categorizer. I categorize everything. And uh, and I love these categories: personal, program, professional, and project. It works very. Very neatly. Now, as people come along and say, come on, there's no such a thing as a purely programmed organization or purely professional organization. And I say, yeah, absolutely. But more or less, many organizations subscribe pretty closely to that description. So what I'm saying is lumps, lumps are not only helpful, they're necessary. We wouldn't get anywhere without lumps. Everything's a lump. A, a podcast is a lump and it's not like a webcast. So splitters like to kind of split hairs every which way. Now, if we take that to practitioners and practice and people who question it, I guess my answer is what I just said. We need lumps. We need categories. We just have to be careful not to overuse them. So in the book, I talk significantly about these four forms of organizations, but then I talk about all kinds of hybrids and categories and or subcategories and uh, and transitions from one to the other and what happens to an organization when it's in transition from personal to program. As many personal to program means you start an entrepreneurial company, you're mass producing widgets, and, uh, and as you get bigger and older, you get more and more programmed and more and more 
kind of uh, machine-like in your structure. But in between, you're splitting. Right, right. You need you, you need to be aware of splitting, but you need to understand the world in terms of categories. Got it. So I hope that this enlightened those practitioners who are not so sure about the value of, of the book. It, it, to me, it was just clear that these are useful lenses to appreciate and interpret just the word of organizations on a daily basis. Yeah, lenses is a great word, Alex. Right. Okay, so let's talk about strategy because strategy is also a key theme of your work and it, it is obviously part of the book as well. You know, you are perhaps most well known for your ideas on strategy and in particular for arguing that strategy is not just executed by companies after some deliberate planning, but instead, and perhaps more importantly, that it, it emerges from past experience, from synthesis of past experience, right? So I'm curious, after several decades of work and scholarship on strategy, is there anything that has changed in your ideas about strategy over the past few decades? If yes, what has changed? And if not, why not? Well, I think it's been reinforced, frankly. <clears throat> Once people get the idea that strategy is a process of learning, it's not a process of planning. It's a process of learning. And what I mean by emergent strategy is that step by step, action by action, decision by decision, you make your way to some new way of functioning. My favorite example is IKEA in the furniture business. It got into the business of selling unassembled furniture because a worker tried to put a table on his in his car and didn't fit. So he took the legs off and then came the strategic moment. This is strategic. This is a worker taking a leg taking legs off a table and somebody saying, hey, wait a minute, if we have to do that, so do our customers. And that created an enormous change in IKEA's strategy and made it the biggest furniture retailer in the world, I believe. So strategy is learning and strategy is perceiving changes and they don't necessarily come from the top. They may have to be uh, this, I don't know what the top is, but they have to be accepted at, at senior management levels. And, and you need an open culture in the organization for those ideas to get through. It took IKEA, by the way, 15 years to perfect that. You know, you know those little gizmos you put in to put the screws in an IKEA table? I mean, think of how long it took them to work that out. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So have my views changed or have I learned anything new? I think even more so. Once people, you know, when you see it, you'll believe it. And uh, and when people see emergent strategy, they start to believe it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love the example of IKEA. It's just fascinating to see how strategy can emerge from serendipitous moments like that. I like the word serendipitous a lot. You talk about serendipity a lot as well. By the way, you you haven't seen this, but I just did a uh, a short piece that's going to be published called "Is Serendipity Serendipitous?" It was a uh, it was a uh, workshop, not a workshop, but a session at the Academy of Management, where about seven of us all talked about serendipity. Yeah, I was there. Oh, you you were there in the audience. So, but maybe the audience wasn't. So, uh, the main points is amazingly unexpected things happen, but the number of unexpected things that could happen is not so small. So some of them are bound to happen. Yeah, amazing. Let me tell you this. You know that this podcast is serendipitous. Actually, I opened a YouTube channel during the pandemic talking about strategy, foresight, management, but I didn't know the direction it would go until... Somebody very high in, you know, in the rankings, an expert in foresight, criticized one of my videos. And then I decided, all right, let's have a debate about this. And we published an episode that was the first debate. And then I realized, hmm, maybe I should do more of these conversations. And yeah. then it became a podcast. You are the 20th guest of the podcast. And it became one of the most important parts of the YouTube channel. The podcast just came out of... Nowhere. I had no idea about that. But that's the way these things happen. You bump into someone in an elevator and changes your life. You know, love at first sight. You bump into someone and that's it. But, you know, if they left five minutes later, you might have bumped into someone else and been just as happy. <laughs> you know? True, true. 
or sad. So uh, <laughs> I think we need we need to manage as we uh, even if it comes. We need to manage serendipity. We need to be ready. If you know, have a business card in your pocket when you get into an elevator. Every time you get into an elevator, because who knows what's going to happen, and you only have a few floors, so you can go in your pocket and say, "Here, let's do this." Yeah, you're prepared for serendipities to come. Yeah. So still on strategy and uh, in a way also about foresight, which is one of the big themes of the podcast, which I know audience would love to hear about. So there is, there is an idea I have about foresight and strategy that I would like to, to run by you to see what you think. So as mentioned, you argue that strategy is predominantly emergent from synthesis of, of previous experience. So let's consider the case where companies practice strategic foresight activities such as scenario planning, right? In scenario planning, what happens is that several scenarios are developed and then the current strategy is stress tested in a simulation against those scenarios, right? So in a way, these scenarios are also a simulation of experience, right? They're not past experience, they are future experience. So my big question to you, and this is something actually I've been grappling with for a while with two colleagues of mine, where we're actually trying to write a piece on this, hopefully it will come out. My question for you is, am I right to say that scenarios help us to determine or improve strategy from the futures in the same way synthesis of experience helps us to determine or improve strategy from the past. Yes, I think scenario planning or, or scenario thinking, maybe is a better term, is uh, it can be helpful because it gets you thinking about what could happen. I bumped into someone recently who remembers attending a session I gave at McKinsey in London like 30 years ago or more. Uh, oh, this guy worked for Shell and Shell was famous for scenario planning back then. And, and, and my feeling about scenario planning is, number one, yes, think about what might happen, uh, because maybe you'll be prepared to react to it more quickly, having thought through it. I hope that in Washington, they're thinking about what Putin might be doing in the Ukraine, because otherwise they could blow us all up. I hope people are doing that. It's absolutely mandatory. But a few things to understand. Number one, we may not get it right very difficult to predict, even to predict alternate possibilities, because something weird is going to happen. Would anybody have predicted five years ago, or, or maybe 10 years ago, that uh, Putin would go into the Ukraine? Today, people might predict that, uh, that China might go into Taiwan. Yeah, we can predict that because we see all kinds of things. But can we, number one, predict what is going to happen given the possibilities, and number two, be able to prepare for it. Mm. The other concern I have about scenario planning comes from a study we did many years ago of U.S. strategy in Vietnam. Mm. And the Green Berets, which was a special Marine force, was, a, was scenario planning in a way, as I recall the study. Uh, they were there in case. The trouble with being there in case, if you establish it in your structure or your organization by creating the Green Berets, is they'll find a way to become useful. And so the scenario becomes self-fulfilling because after all, we've thought it through, it's all ready, so let's go. That's the that's not the danger, but that's a danger of scenario planning. Well, I think you're touching on very important point on scenario planning. They're not supposed to predict. It's more about the simulation experience itself and they can be they can they can stimulate overconfidence towards one particular future so that you're trapped into that future you put it you put it you put it much better you put it much better and uh you can get trapped into it but also you know a famous dane or actually several famous danes apparently once said that uh it's difficult to predict especially the future and and, and uh, we can predict uh, things that repeat, like I'm looking out at the lake at our house here, and I know there's going to be snow on that lake in January. 
I can predict that, but I can't predict this continuity. I can't predict the fact that we had a big windstorm a couple of months ago and a big tree fell in our lot. I never experienced that, never happened before. Now, when you say scenario planning is not prediction, isn't it a prediction of several possibilities? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yes. It's not a prediction of one will happen, but it's a prediction that this is among several that could happen. I would say yes and no, in so far as it's an anticipation of what could happen. Prediction mm-hmm. assumes that what you say it's is going to happen. So it's it yes, it's an anticipation. But beyond that, I would say the anticipation is not done in order to prepare to those specific scenarios that you develop, but rather to develop the capacity of preparedness in general. So to to develop a capacity of coping with uncertainty in general. That's, of course, ideal, right? As you said, I want to emphasize it's not usually the case. Most often, unfortunately, scenarios are developed so that you prepare only to those. And that can be actually stifling. So it, it, it can backfire in a way, because if you prepare only to those four scenarios and then the fifth scenario is maybe a pandemic that you didn't take into account, then you're you're screwed if the pandemic occurs, right? So yes and no. Hey, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen. What, what's going on now? <laughs> right. so, so it's still a planning mentality in a way. Right. Then you go back to planning. So that's purposeless to do scenarios, right? Yeah, we can plan things that repeat. We can't plan discontinuity. We can't anticipate discontinuities. You know, Churchill didn't think that nuclear power would create much of a bomb. Mm. The man who created IBM didn't believe in 1947 that computers would sell more than about four or five. Yeah. He didn't have to get it right. He just had to get it right before everyone else. He, he got it wrong at the beginning but he got it right before everyone else. Yeah, you touch upon another super important point, which is the complete impossibility to look beyond the second order consequences. You might be able, you know, you might be able to predict first order consequences, but then when you venture into second and third and fourth order consequences, it's just completely useless, right? There's something that goes with that, which is this idea that after all, they knew. You know, this thing that something yeah. happens, like what happened in Hawaii recently or whatever. And, and well, but look, there was a report in 1743. No, there was a report in 2016 that predicted this. Yeah, there were thousands of reports, thousands of things, you know, and you can't blame them because the one happened to come true. True, true. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that I was galvanized even further by your confirming my ideas about scenario planning. I have another very interesting question that somehow stems from this, which is about management education. So in your work, you make the case that management is more of a craft and uh, more of an art, you know, more of a practice rather than a science. And you also make the case that the typical management education program, such as an MBA, is not really capable of teaching that craft, right? And it goes back to the inability to experience and simulate the job of a manager, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk a lot about the inadequacy of the MBA, right, to educate managers. So I want to ask you about the PhD, which is something that I have not heard you talking about. Because recently, I have asked this question to many of many of the previous guests in the podcast. The PhD program is getting increasingly obsessed with theory. And that's not just the PhD program. You know, management education and management research in general is going into this very theory-heavy, theory-obsessed direction, especially in North America, right? And unfortunately, there seems to be less and less connection with practice. Sometimes you take a PhD in management, you're even discouraged to get, you know, consulting gigs on a side. It's very disconnected with practice. So I'm really curious to hear, what are your thoughts about the PhD in management? I know your thoughts about the MBA in management, but I want to hear about your views on the typical PhD, American style, you know, PhD in management. Well, first of all, disconnect is nothing new for business schools. Mm. There have been plenty of people in business schools who were practitioners and came in, and there have been people who are very practical and connect to practitioners. But disconnect 
is nothing new. And if you look at research, what concerns me about research and publication more and more is it just seems to be kind of angels on the head of a pin. They're minor little things and 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 I, I can't imagine any practitioner getting uh, getting excited. You know, I I get emails for new articles, and I read the abstract, read the title, and read the abstract. Sometimes I think the abstract should say "see title," but anyway, I see the abstract and I see the title, and uh, and I think first of all, it's so convoluted. The titles are so convoluted, yeah. repeating words. So. I'm not sure I see this as the advent of theory. Uh, I see this as the advent of very narrow empiricism that tries to be theoretical, but theory, good theory synthesizes, good theory pulls things together. It doesn't break them apart. So you right. develop theory about whether, you know, the, you know, how to screw little screws into eyeglasses or something. You know, it's necessary for someone, but but it's not great theory. Right. But the 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 disconnect of the MBA is the I I, I don't think the MBA is completely uh, irrelevant. I think this idea that you're creating managers is 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 damaging because you don't create a manager out of a non-manager in a classroom any more than you cr- create a swimmer out of a non-swimmer in a, in a classroom. You don't you don't create swimmers in a classroom. You don't create managers in a classroom because management is not. A science, as you notice, but it's also not a profession. You're not trained like a physician to be a physician. And so the MBA programs are are excellent for the business functions like marketing and finance, but that's not managing. That has to be known by managers. They have to be aware of it and, and be able to understand it and deal with it. But managing is the art and craft and a little bit of science, not much, of all the things that managers have to do. Now, disconnecting the PhD programs, it's been in the German tradition forever, I guess, or for a long time, to theorize on very high levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. And it can be interesting if it's good. Very often you read it and you can't kind of figure out what the heck they're talking about. But that's been a long tradition. And in fact, people point out that the business schools in America came from similar efforts in Germany, uh, J.C. Spender's work. So so it came out of Germany and uh, and came into the United States. So it started with theory. Then, of course, Harvard adopted cases. And the trouble with cases is that you get 80 people sitting in a classroom who never heard of the company before two days ago, having read 20 pithy pages about the company, and they're propo- they're supposed to pronounce on what that company should do. Talk about superficiality. If you're trained to do this hundreds of times in an MBA program, you come out thinking, give me a pithy few pages and I'll give you a decision. And it's destroying right. management. And the, the evidence, the bit of evidence we have about MBAs as chief executives is they do worse than non-MBAs on average and get paid more, by the way. So if we come back, to PhD programs, you know, managers and PhD students have one key thing in common. They function between the concrete and the conceptual. They function between action on the ground and concepts or abstractions in the air. Strategy is an abstraction. You know, they took the legs off the table. That's the concrete. And somebody said, wait a minute, we could be selling furniture, all our furniture that way. That's the strategic conception. So managers have to function both ways. Managers who are only on the ground never do anything interesting. And managers who are only in the air uh, never get anywhere on the ground. Uh, And PhD students have to be exactly the same. They have to be able to connect the concrete with the conceptual. That's why a lot of research methods, like sending out questionnaires and so on, doesn't necessarily, depending on what you're studying, doesn't necessarily expose the student to the depth of what they're studying. Mm. Sometimes you've got to get out and probe and dig. You know, good research is detective work. Sherlock Holmes Mm. is the model for a good researcher. So, yeah, I love what you say about managers and PhD students having something in common, and that is the abstraction part. Yeah. 
they also have another thing in common, which is solving problems. They're supposed to be solving problems, right? And problems are inherently like the definition of a problem is something that is practice driven. Right. So 100% with you on that. So what do you think are possible ways out? I, of course, here we cannot do a scenario planning exercise on the spot. It's going to be a bit challenging. But if you had to say briefly, let's say you're talking to a dean of a major business school or to a group, a group of dean of, of major business schools globally, and you had to tell them a couple of things to change, what are the possible futures out of this, this problem? Well, I'm talking to our dean now. You are. Who has a strategy exercise going. And my suggestion for us, because we're strong on both sides, is to concentrate on specialized degree programs for specialists like in finance or in marketing or in operations management, whatever, retailing, and general programs for managers, of which we have several, like IMPM.org and so on, IMHL.org for healthcare, that tap into the experiences of the managers in the classroom. And they sit at round tables, they reflect on their experience, and they spend half the time sharing their experience with each other. So I might drop in some concepts about emergent strategy, and then it's over to them at their tables, do you do this kind of thing in your organization? Should you do more of it? How could you do more of it? What does it mean for you? And so on. And I want to make a comment about prescription too, because when you talk about being practical and so on, our job is not to tell managers how to manage or to take five easy steps to make strategy or whatever it is. Our job is insight. Our job is to bring understanding to managers of the things they deal with. So this book, Understanding Organizations, is about enabling managers to understand better the organizations that they run and that they have to deal with. So the better your understanding, the better you are. Our job is not to tell them how to apply these ideas. Our job is to give them the ideas. They'll find all kinds of ways to apply them. Right, right. I see how this would work for executives with some experience. But what about those people who want to study management and they have no experiences? So what about bachelor bachelor programs? Is it an oxymoron to study management without experience or is it possible to recreate some form of experience in classroom by perhaps having managers discussing with them? The best thing we can do in a bachelor's program is make them smarter. <laughs> Okay, got it. Help them to get smarter. I would, if I was designing a, a bachelor's program in commerce or business, I would have them do courses in economics, anthropology, mathematics, geography. I would have them get much smarter and organization theory because everybody, that they should be using my book and undergraduates because everybody needs to understand organization, not only the managers, mm -hmm. anybody who works in an organization, that's everybody pretty much has to understand how organizations work. We can do that. So you would keep management education for the postgraduate and uh, post-experience work, so to speak. Yes, postgraduate with experience, because you can take people who are managers and enhance their practice, but you can't create a knowledge of that practice and any more than you can teach someone how to swim in a classroom. For sure. But once they've been in the water, we could take them and say, well, here's what the butterfly stroke looks like. In that line of thinking, would PhD students need some management experience? Not necessarily. Any more than oncologists need to have had cancer. I'm not saying management is cancer, but I'm saying that oncologists don't have to have had cancer. Len Sales was probably one of the most brilliant people on writing about management when nobody was writing about management, his, his book in 1964. He went straight from from bachelor, from bachelor from high school to bachelor's to master's to PhD. Never worked, at least uh, that I know full-time, and wrote brilliant books. Yeah, you know, you don't need to do it to observe it or treat it in the case of physicians. Okay, fair. Thanks for the super interesting insights about management. So I wanted to 
zoom out to society more broadly because you also have a book about rebalancing society. Actually, that is the book that you got me signed at the at the Bariton Kohler signing booth this this August. Yeah, okay. So you weren't one of the Americans. You weren't the one American. I was one of the few Western people, yeah. Maybe there were a few more Americans. Who knows? Yeah. In any case, that was a great book. And I was very happy to see that. I know that your publisher wasn't so happy for you to, to go in that direction because they wanted you to stick to management where you are most well-known. But I actually did appreciate the book a lot because, as, as you know, I think manager scholars should venture into societal problems more broadly. So that was great to see that book. And uh, I appreciate that in the book, what you argue is that society is made of three pillars, the private sector, the public sector, and communities. And you also argue that we have been neglecting communities in the West, and that is why society is not so balanced. So we should rebalance it by giving more weight to communities. And this point of view actually is very similar to one of the big themes of the podcast, which I mentioned to you, which is metamodernism. And in metamodernism, actually, what is argued is that we should transcend politics, we should transcend left and right, and we should definitely give more weight to communities. In fact, we had two guests who are experts on metamodernism on the podcast. So I think this is very similar to what you argue in the book. Now, metamodern thinkers also suggest a lot of policy examples on how to do this. So my question for you would be, what are the policy examples, the policy guidelines you would give to a government? Because at the end of the day, it has to start from the government to give more weights to communities in our societies. Okay, just a couple of things. Mm. The publisher himself, the CEO, if you like, of Barrett Kohler was actually very keen on the book. Okay, fair. But but he had to convince his marketing people who, as you say, you know, this is mark this is a management company. And you know, I don't think they've lost money on it, but but it hasn't sold hugely. They're not making their fortunes on it. So the policy implications of community, you know, in rebalancingsociety.org, which is my website, which goes much farther into the consequences of the book, the rebalancing society book, I have a table where you can click on any one of uh, about 18, I think it's about 18 dots, what you can do, what your community can do, what your business can do, what your government can do, and so on. And and because everybody kept saying after the first book, yeah, but what can I do? You know, this is very interesting. I like the framework, public, private, plural, but what can I do? And uh, And so I pulled together everything I could think of and everything I could find everybody else thought about and threw it all on the table. So anybody wants to know what they can do, they can, they, they can go to that table. And, and I think what that reflects is the fact that it's about letting a thousand or a million flowers bloom. Mm. In other words, we need people to undertake as much the, as they as they can think of and more and more creative. You know, the trouble is when something goes wrong, we march. Uh, you know, when Trump was elected, they marched. Mm. So what? Trump laughed at it. Mm -hmm. These weren't the people who voted for him. He couldn't care less. When, uh, you know, when people were angry with finance, they occupied Wall Street. Well, Wall Street never did anything wrong. Wall Street's a street. It's concrete and asphalt. Wall Street is not the problem. It's the behaviors behind the closed doors of Wall Street that are the problem. Go after that. Go after that. Don't occupy Wall Street. It's it, it's an abstraction. It doesn't get in. We have to get much more clever. Okay. And then how do we consolidate? You know, I sort of see three stages to one is a declaration of what we believe, a kind of guideline. And we did this with what I call the declaration of our interdependence. And, and that's on that website, and it's also there by itself, the declaration of our interdependence. For example, we believe that we hold the following truths to be self-evident. Okay, we hold the following truths to be self-evident, that all people are created dependent. 
on each other, our earth and its climate. So that's the way it starts. So, and then it goes into the, the three sectors and all that. So first is some overall arching guideline for what we need to do and what we need to believe in. So that's the declaration. Then there are all these things that you could be doing, all these things, you know, uh, going after egregious behaviors and so on and so forth. And third is consolidation. How do you consolidate all this into a viable movement? And then it occurred to me, if you look at actual major social changes, they consolidate themselves. It's the first step, the declaration that leads to the consolidation. So who consolidated the civil rights movement? in the United States? Who consolidated the Eastern Europeans who rose up en masse to throw communism out? Who consolidated Martin Luther's 95 theses tacked on the wall of a church? People got together, saw the light, and moved en masse. I guess these are the policy implications of policy guidelines. It's on that... Uh, website of mine, except for the last part, which I just thought about, which is consolidation actually happens kind of spontaneously. Lovely. I'll make sure to put this in the show notes. Thank you, Andrew. So as our, as our chat is drawing to an end, I usually like to ask my guests a more lighthearted question. You are a very prolific writer. I am curious of what you do to detach or balance, compensate, decompress, however you want to call it. What do you do to detach from your writing? I know you've been kayaking. Do you still do kayaking? Yeah, not kayaking, but canoeing. Canoeing. Okay. So this is where I live most of the time. Can you see the lake? Oh, it's beautiful. I hope you guys are watching on YouTube because you will be able to see this. Yeah, maybe not. I could do it in front of the window if you want. In your canoe over there. Yeah, yeah, just quickly. That's beautiful. You see it? Yes. And you have your own can canoe, I assume. It's it's canoeing that we do. Uh, kayaking. I, I do like those. Those you're looking at kayaks there. The canoe is under the uh, just in front of me here, near the house. But. Uh, find it more difficult to get in and out of a kayak. Once you're in a kayak, it's very stable, but it's hard to get in and out of a kayak. So the two of us, Dulce and I, go out in a canoe. Just when the lake looks like this, when it's calm. You know, I don't do yoga or any of those things. I canoe. And there's a there's a video that's actually been seen a million times on YouTube about me canoeing. It doesn't show a million times because it's been put up and re-put up a few times and so on. But we estimate it's been seen about a million times. And it's just me canoeing on this lake. Well, I, I guess the environment, the beauty of the environment is the real key of it, right? Because when when you canoe in an environment like that, you just you're just forced to wonder at, at the beauty of it. And then you can stop thinking about what writing for a while until you start again. Yeah. This, uh, well, it's not actually that. I often scribble ideas while I'm canoeing. Oh, that's fascinating. So actually it fuels into your, your flow, idea flow. Yeah, yeah. It, I just muse and think. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, the, the um, this lake has is about two kilometers long, but only has about 15 houses on one end. So it's balanced. This lake is balanced. Uh, there's one house at the far end of the lake, but that's a beaver house, a beaver lodge. Mm. But at this end of the lake are a few people houses, but the rest of the lake is wilderness, except for the beaver lodge, which I guess is wilderness too. Thanks for sharing this with us, Henry. I, I really like the, the view. So if, if the audience wants to follow your work, where are you most active? I am following you on LinkedIn, but perhaps you want to redirect the audience elsewhere. Where should they follow your work? LinkedIn for sure. Minsberg.org has is, is got all my stuff. YouTube, we, we now have a channel with all these Minsberg Minutes with Minsberg, and I hope we can make a couple of them out of this. Yes podcast or a webcast or i mix these things all up but um but i hope we can make a couple out of that so 
yeah, look for LinkedIn is best. And people should look at rebalancingsociety.org. Right. You can get the idea of it in about five or 10 minutes. You could spend hours on it, but you could get the idea of it in five or 10 minutes. Thanks for that. I will put all those links in the show notes. I thank you for the awesome interview and for all your work. The book is out right now at Barrett and Kohler. Uh, you can purchase it on Amazon as well. I'll put the link to the book in the show notes as well. Henry, I want to thank you for this time that you've given to the interview. It was really awesome. I'd I love to hear more about what, what your, your ideas are right now, how they have been developing. And also thank you for bouncing back on my ideas. It was, it was awesome. Alex, I get interviewed a lot and a lot of it is very good, but this interview was awesome. <laughs> Uh, your questions, your preparation, fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Really appreciated that. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Okay, bye.